And before I found out about FI, I thought that investing was only for the rich, which we all know is not true, right? I also thought that donating meaningful sums of money, meaningful sums of money, was also only for the rich. This talk today resonates with you and maybe anyone else who's having like a similar feeling as they pursue early retirement. So today, I'm going to be talking about effective giving, what it is, and how we as an FI community could have a positive impact together. Do you guys remember the Australian bushfires of 2019? Yeah, it was like the beginning of COVID. And I personally was reading the news like way more than I normally do just because I didn't have as much to do. And I'm scrolling through all these pictures, these devastating pictures. And there's been a lot of things that have tugged on my heartstrings. But for whatever reason, this just really, it just really got to me. It's one of the biggest wildlife disasters in our history. And I'm sitting there, I'm sitting in my boyfriend at the time, his living room, staring at a Red Cross donation page and wondering, how much should I donate? Okay, if I donate, these fires are moving really quickly. Is it even going to get there in time? Is it going to help anyone? And frankly, if I'm being really really honest with you guys, do I have enough money to donate? I was pretty close to hitting FI by this time. I was sitting on a million dollar nest egg. A million dollars. Of course I can donate. I have the money to donate, right? Like, just do it. But I think I was sitting there paralyzed by guilt, like lack of knowledge. Like, am I actually doing good? Am I actually helping people? And also, I think that scarcity mindset that so many of us within the FI community share, like, do I have enough? I'm not FI yet. Like, I don't, I haven't reached this big goal. Do I have enough? So to give or not to give, and if to give, then to where? So life looks a little different for me, for me now, from going, sitting up and looking at this Red Cross donation page to, I now run a nonprofit where 100% of the proceeds go to charity I've taken a giving pledge, which means I donate a certain amount of income. uh, uh, You know, I don't make income, but I donate a certain amount of money each year to effective causes. And I've also pledged to give the vast majority of my net worth upon my death. So how did I get from that to this? Let's talk about a more positive fire, shall we, right? So when I learned about fire, big, big changes in my way of thinking about giving and philanthropy happened in large part because I had like the autonomy and the freedom to really think for myself completely and wholly. I have been an early retiree for three plus years now. And you guys, I did all the things that you dream about doing when you become an early retiree. I took care of myself. I slept in. I worked out. I read all the books that I wanted to read. I traveled. I spent time with friends and family. But spending each day exactly how I wanted to was pretty great. But it didn't give me a sense of purpose any more than my 12 years in commercial real estate did. And so I'm sitting there going, like, what's the point of this whole thing? What am I striving for? And I I felt privileged before I reached fire, but I still like suffered with everyone else. Like, oh, my boss sucks. <laughs> like, oh, I have to wake up early to my alarm. But when I pulled the early retired re-trigger, oh my gosh, the pri- like the privilege that I was aware of, my guilt that I felt of that I got to do this thing while so many people are still struggling and still suffering just took over me. And things got so bad that I actually resorted to posting my feelings in the Women's Personal Finance Facebook group. Is anyone a part of that? Yeah. And I, maybe you guys saw this. And I said, how can I turn these thoughts and feelings into something positive? I was struggling. And you know, things are really bad when you're just vomiting your feelings into the internet and just, you know, asking strangers <laughs> to give you feedback. I will say that all um, 79 comments were very lovely and accommodating, but most of them were encouraging me, encouraging me to figure out my like why, my purpose. 
And I found a big part of my why in this book called, it's by Peter Singer, it's called The Life You Can Save. Who's read a book here who's changed their life, right? Like we're the FI community. This book really changed mine for the better. And before I found out about FI, I thought that investing was only for the rich, which we all know is not true, right? And just like that, I, when I before I read this book, I also thought that donating meaningful sums of money, meaningful sums of money, was also only for the rich. Mm-hmm. And I, and before this, like I would donate to things like the Australian bushfires. Maybe a friend was running a marathon, and I wanted to support that person in their cause. Maybe someone would come up to me and ask for money on the street. But I had no systematic way of giving of donating. And so naturally, like you're going to have some self-doubt if you don't have a plan of action behind something. And so this book gave me a very doable, actionable way in which I can literally, literally help to save lives. And so at the crux of Singer's book, has anyone read this book, by the way? So at the crux of this book is the drowning child thought experiment. And it goes something like this. Imagine you are walking through the park, a park, and you see splashing from afar. And as you get up close, you realize that it's a child. It's a child that's actually drowning in this pond. And you look around. Where is the parents? Is there anyone else? And you realize it's just you and this child. Would you guys jump in? Would you, would you jump in and save this drowning child if you were in this situation? Would you guys do it? Okay. Yeah, I hear yeses, head nods. Okay. But what if you were on your way to a wedding and you were wearing your nicest outfit and your nicest pair of shoes? The question becomes slightly more complex. If you jump in, you're for certain going to ruin your shoes. Would you guys still jump in? Okay. That's good. It's good that we had a bunch of head nods still. So we can all agree that we want to do, this is the right thing to do, right? The reality is that every day we are facing this issue and maybe we are not seeing this child drowning in a pond right before our very eyes. And actually this this is a real picture of a guy who jumped in a lake at his wedding to like save these children. So he fa- he was faced with the issue. So we're not necessarily faced with this every day, but there are millions, millions of children on the brink of death right now, every day, who are dying. And we can actually really help them for the cost of a pair of shoes. So Singer presents this argument. How are we to condemn the person, right, who wouldn't jump in to the pond to ruin a nice pair of shoes if the same situation applies to us, those same moral values apply to us when we could be spending a similar amount of money in helping people? today. So to me, this argument was really powerful. Like this argument resonated with me. But to where? Like where am I going to give my money? So FIRE is a community of optimizers. When we spend any amount of money, it's going to go to something good, right? Like it's going to build us a happy life. It's going to go to our retirement plan. Why should donating any different, be any different? If we are going to spend a dollar on charity, shouldn't it be to do the most good possible? Um, And so when I think about charity, I think about taking like a data-driven approach to charity versus like a personal approach, just like you guys don't like invest in whatever you just feel like investing, right? There's like a plan, there's research, there's information. Donating shouldn't be any different. And so here's what a personal approach might feel like versus a data-driven approach. A personal approach means it's affected me. Maybe it's affected someone I know, my family. Perhaps it serves my local community. I can feel the emotion behind it. A data-driven approach looks something like there is evidence that the methodology works. There is true data that shows that the money that you're spending or the imp- the, or the efforts that you're you're making have a real impact. It's cost effective, generally speaking, or like I like to say, cost smart. And then the actions of any of these organizations are 
are actually executed and measurable. And the people that are impacted by these issues, they are taken into account seriously and meaningfully. Okay, so let's go through an example of what a data-driven approach might look like. 1.2 million people each year, each year, die from waterborne-related illnesses. And that's because of things like cholera, typhoid, hepe, diarrhea. It also leads to malnutrition in children. 1.2 million people. That, that's like a statistic for our brain. It's hard for it to understand. So imagine like taking the entire total population of Colorado Springs right here, plus the entire population of Denver combined and all those people just disappearing each year. And so this is really hard for us to understand, <clears throat> um, like, just in our brains and when you just see a statistic like 1.2 million people are dying. But given the magnitude, given the magnitude of this issue, researchers are trying to find an effective way forward. So as a group, we're going to do a little exercise of what data-driven charity might look like. Which of these sanitation programs provides the most healthy years of life per $1,000? In other words, which of these sanitation programs are the most effective and have the highest impact per cost? So we'll do this by like a show of hands. I'll let you all take a look at it for a second. Think of what you think is the right choice. Okay, so who thinks number one by show of hands providing piped water and flushing toilets? Okay, good chunk of people. What about giving people chlorine to disinfect their water? And lastly, giving sick children zinc with their electrolyte salts. This helps with acute diarrhea. Okay, so it's like mostly one and two, a little bit of three. Okay, so this is how we're going to measure it. Each heart on the slide represents one year of healthy life. Let's see how different water treatment um, <clears throat> techniques help uh, get us like the most healthy lives per $1,000. So option number one, piped water and flushing toilets gives us six months of healthy life per $1,000. And part of that is from saving lives, but also just preventing illness. So if I were sick, if I were really, really sick, I would spend $1,000 for six months of healthy life. So to me, like, this is a pretty good deal. For those that voted for option two, giving people chlorine to disinfect their water is about 10 times as effective as pipe water and flushing toilets per that same $1,000. Option number three, Giving, who voted for a bunch of people, or just a few people, right? Giving sick children zinc with their electrolyte salts can result in an extra 33 years of healthy living, right? So, of course, waterborne illnesses, though, aren't the only things that, or, or not the only diseases that people in low-income countries are suffering from, right? Like, what if we broaden the search to more diseases? While the World's Bank best guess for every $1,000, um, if we put towards preventing and tre treating malaria, is that we would have an extra 200 years of healthy living. And this is thanks to a medication called artisanate, which helps treat malaria, as well as malaria prevention techniques like bed nets and the such. <clears throat> if we go on to compare this to high-income countries, where we're willing to spend $1,000 for maybe an extra week of living due to like taking um, new cancer types drugs and new cancer research, we can see that the comparison is even greater. And it's not to say that funding water treatment solutions and new cancer research is not worthy. It's certainly a cause worth spending money on. This example is just goes to show you to emphasize like the funding opportunity and the amount of lives that we can save if we were to sort of target something like malaria and treatment interventions. And that the most effective interventions are not just like five times more effective or 10 times more effective, that they can literally be hundreds of times more effective based on the evidence that we have 
at this time. So some of you in the audience may be going, this seems a little cold. (laughs) Seems like a cold way of evaluating how to do good. But the reality is that making charitable giving decisions and leading with our heart is not always like in our best interest and in everyone's best interest. In fact, choosing from our heart could be unfair. Why? Because we are biased. We are human. We know this from literally preaching to everyone about FI and being like, why are you guys getting on this bandwagon? It's because people are human and they have different things that are important to them at different times. And so I believe in taking the emotion out of it, not always, but just for like the majority of my giving and my thinking and focusing on the awesome resources out there that have done the research and the work for me already to figure out how to be the most effective giver. And so these are just some of the organizations I wanted to highlight to you. Uh, Give Well and The Life You Can Save, which is the book I mentioned already, but it's also an organization. These are both charity aggregators and they have done the work. They have done the research to find high impact opportunities to help people. And so they rigorously vet charities and organizations and their impact and their cost effectiveness. And they will drop charities from the list and add other charities to the list. And they're highly transparent. My two favorite organizations in terms of like community and finding people are these groups of pledge takers. People have committed to donating, say, 1%, 2%, 3%, 4% of their income every year to causes like we just saw. And one of the reasons why I like these communities is because I like, just like being here, I like being around people who I could follow and emulate and admire. And so giving what we can, they're mostly known. This is the pledge that I've taken. They have different pledge levels, but they're mostly known for the 10% pledge. So there are a lot of people, thousands and thousands of people out there that have pledged to give 10% of their income to charity each year. And one for the world is exactly what it sounds like. It's a 1% pledge and an awesome place to start. And then lastly is the Center for Effective Altruism. The Effective Altruism Movement, has anyone heard of that here a couple people yeah they're they work alongside a lot of these groups and their mission is to do the most good possible with the resources we have so it's really like a optimized approach to how we can have the most positive impact on the world and they are a wealth of resources they have events communities i sit on the board for effective altruism salt lake city um, and there's probably a local chapter in your area So here are a couple of examples of organizations that would be at the top of the Life You Can Save's charity list. And what these orgs have in common is they are all tackling three things. They're tackling problems that are big. So they affect a lot of people or they cause a lot of suffering. These problems are generally neglected. They are not going to be noted in the media the way the Australian bushfires were. They're generally not talked about, but people are still suffering from these causes and also, and also they, like I said earlier, they rigorously track their progress. So all, all the problems are tractable and real and transparent. So for example, educate girls. There is 1.32 million girls out of school right now. And so they focus on designing and executing programs to uh, make sure girls are in school and staying in school. Uh, and then I'll just go through one more, Give Directly. This is the organization that I've chosen to send all my personal donations to, and they do direct cash infusions to recipients, but they also provide a lot of resources and support around um, like those things without telling people what to do. I love having all these resources in front of me to like follow these guidelines, and I think we as an FI community, we also have so many, so many resources to contribute to these movements. Like we know what it means to optimize. We know what it means to budget. We know what it means to invest. Like we have it together here. And so I think if we can lend our skills to the giving community or the philanthropic community, that they can then give and do so with financial confidence. And it's for this reason that I started a free coaching program for aspiring philanthropists to help them with their financial plans. I also came up with this tool called the Philanthropy Calculator, which helps people understand if they were to take a giving pledge, what is that impact to their FI timeline, to their portfolio? And spoiler alert, taking something like the one one for the world pledge actually doesn't have as great of an impact as you'd think. So I'll leave everyone in this room with one final thought. What can we as an FI community do better? 
what if, in addition to telling all of our blog readers and our community and our friends, that maybe if we stopped eating out so much, we can all retire a little bit earlier? But what if we also told them that we can help lift people out of poverty and literally save lives for just the cost of a couple of dinners or even a nice pair of shoes? Thank you. Thank you.